可以。OK， 呃、uh, ，Let's see。I'm in the dark. Let me see if I can fix welcome. it. Welcome, welcome everyone to Harvard CMSA Quantum Matter Seminar. We are very happy to invite Billy Boyle Smith from IPMU, and he'll be speaking about uh, his recent work. And this is uh, one of the series of work on the related topics on uh, conformionic conformal field theory. And yeah, so. Let me remind the audience, please feel free to interact, ask questions during the talks, and let's directly welcome Philip. It's all yours, please. Thank you. Okay. So, wait a second. Yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to speak here. So let's just say this talk is about chiral fermionic CFTs, a central charge C less than or equal to 16. So our goals are pretty simple. We would like to classify all chiral thermionic CFTs with C less than or equal to 16. And in doing so, confirm that the list of heterotic string theories written down in the 1980s is actually complete. <clears throat> and as a bonus, we'll also construct the duality webs of these conformal field theories. And I have to thank my collaborators, of course, which are two of which are in the audience. So this work is done in collaboration with Ying Lin, Yuji Tachikawa, and Yunshin Zheng. <clears throat> So before we get started, here's a preview of some of our main results. <clears throat> so this is um, the chiral fermionic and bosonic CFTs of C, a multiple of four, and their duality webs under topological operations in northern fermion parity. <clears throat> and this is just a preview. We'll have this slide a bit later and discuss it in more detail. And we should also give some shout outs to the other groups who have worked on this problem both recently and in the past. So the problem of classifying chiral CFTs, both fermionic and bosonic, <clears throat> well, started with Gerald uh, Hohn, who basically solved most of the problem in 1995, where he classified them up to C equals 15.5. <clears throat> Sometime later in 2017, Duncan and friends did it up to 12, which seems to me to imply they didn't know that Hohn had already done it. And then more recently, the three of us uh, did the class push it a little bit further. So we've already seen talks by Brands and Rayho and, and Gerald and Sven Muller, who classified them up to 23 and 20, 24. So we're in a group who classified them up to 16. <clears throat> so, you know, our work was immediately superseded the very instant it was published, because we all published on the same day. But in a way, so what's our novelty going to be? Well, we're going to take a, a more physical approach. We're going to emphasize the connection with heterotic string theory, which is why we are interested in C up to 16. And we're also going to emphasize the connection to topological phases and anomalies. And we're going to be more pedagogical, <laughs> at least to physicists. OK, so here's the plan. I'll start by motivating why we would want to classify chiral fermionic CFT for central charge C up to 16. And spoiler, that's going to be heterotic string theory. And then I'll review how um, mathematicians classified some of these theories in the past, namely the bosonic case. Uh, and then that will bring us to the main part of the talk, where we'll discuss bosonization, fermionization, and a thing called refermionization, which is a subtle thing that happens when you're doing bosonization of chiral theories. Um, in particular, we'll, we'll look at some subtleties that are often overlooked with bosonization. Uh, or at least I don't think I can spell that anywhere. And then we'll turn to the main technical tool we use to find these Z2 symmetries, or Z2 symmetries, <clears throat> called CAC's theorem. And then we'll apply that. Basically, we'll use CAC's theorem to find all Z2 symmetries, and then we'll fermionize them to get our list of CFTs. And then finally, I'll wrap up by looking at their duality webs and summarizing with some open questions. So here we go. So here's a fact. Heterotic string theories are classified by chiral CFTs of central charge C equals 16. So let's take a moment to recall the basics of why this is the case. <clears throat> so how does the heterotic string work again? Well, the key is the symmetry on the world sheet. You demand that the world sheet has conformal times, times superconformal symmetry. So you demand n equals 0 comma 1. <clears throat> so that means um, is my mouse cursor visible? Because I'm... Yes. Oh, yes. great. Okay. So that means that the left sector of our theory is only required to have conformal symmetry, 
and the back looking set is required to have more than that. It's required to be super conformal. Now, as I said, the key to the theory is the symmetry. And the symmetry determines the ghosts. So the, the ghost systems have central charges 26 and 15, respectively. So I've illustrated that by these bars. Uh, and so we need to fill these bars up with theory. And in particular, we have it has to obey these symmetries. So what's the simplest thing we can write down? Well, we can take a free scalar x, and we can throw in a chiral Majorana vial fermion, psi. And it only needs to be chiral. It only needs to be a right moving part, because remember, only the right moving part needs to be super conformal. The rest can just be conformal. So this is the minimal system with these symmetries. <clears throat> now, the scalar has central charge one, the fermion has central charge a half. So we see that we don't fill up the whole uh, allotment of central charges that we need. But that's fine. We can just take 10 copies of the system, which are our 10 dimensions. But then, of course, this leaves a C equals 16 chiral shaped hole, <clears throat> which I'll call C, which we need to also put in. So what are, our, what, are our, what are our options for C? Well, C must be purely chiral because of course the only central charge left is on the left. And it must be a purely chiral CFT of central charge exactly 16. <clears throat> and in particular, it can be either bosonic or fermionic. Now, let's have a look in a bit more detail about the world sheet to space-time mapping from... Okay, so um, I, should, I should mention, when I said it, even though I said it can be bosonic or fermionic, if it's bosonic, um, you can still pretend it's fermionic, as in, uh, you know, it can, be, it can be bosonic in disguise. So that is, a fermionic thing depends upon a string structure. Well, a bosonic thing also depends upon a spin structure, but in a trivial way. <clears throat> so in particular, if I have a bosonic theory, I can regard it as having both an NS sector and an R sector, just that they're the same, because it doesn't care about spin structure. But it could also be fermionic as well, in which case they would be different. Okay, so let's look at the mapping from states to space-time things. So every theory has a vacuum, and it's unique, and this is the dimension zero operator in the NS sector. <clears throat> And this maps to the graviton and friends. But by friends, I mean two form and dilaton. Okay, so what's the next lowest operator? Well, the next thing has dimension h equals one half, and that maps to tachyons. Notice there's something interesting here. You can only have spin half operators in a fermionic CFT. So that means you can only have tachyons if your world sheet is fermionic. We'll come back to that. So what's next? Well, then next next up is the spin is the dimension one operators, and these always form a Lie algebra under fusion, and rather predictably these maps are the gauge fields. Okay, and everything after that point is massive, so we'll ignore it. Now in the in the in the in the R sector, there may there may or may not be a dimension zero operator. If there is, it's unique, but it need not be there. And also, because we're in the R sector now. There need not be any correlation between spin and fermionicness. So this thing could be fermionic or bosonic. So if it exists, it turns out that it maps to the superpartners of the graviton and friends. So that's interesting. If this operator exists, it implies that the theory has supersymmetry. But, but you know, it's not just sufficient for the, the graviton to have a superpartner, all the other fields must have superpartners as well. Um, so do the tachyons have superpartners? Well, no, actually they don't, because if you have a dimension zero operator in the R sector, your theory is necessarily either bosonic or bosonic times R, i.e. it's not really fermionic. I'll skip the proof of that. But basically, if this operator exists, it's a bosonic theory, which means not only do the top fields have superpartners, but also this, this entire row disappears. And furthermore, uh, the existence of this operator establishes a one-to-one -one correspondence between the NS and the R sectors. So that means that not only are the, not only these two in correspondence, but the dimension ones are in correspondence as well. So all these gauge fields have space-time fermions to, to be their superpartners. So in summary, <clears throat> if C is bosonic, the space-time theory is supersymmetric. Uh, and it, on the contrary, if it's fermionic, then it's not supersymmetric. And furthermore, if it's fermionic, 
then your theory may or may not have free fermions, these dimension half operators. And if it does have any, they're the tachyons. So we can summarize this information in this pretty picture, which on the left has space-time interpretation of things, and on the right has world sheet interpretation. So for example, a bosonic world sheet maps that space on Susie theory. Uh, if it's not bosonic, it may or may not have may or may not have fermions on the world sheet, and these map to tachyon or tachyon free space-time theories. So that's the review of how the heterotic string construction works. But now we'd like to go back to this, C. What are our options for C? I.e., what are the purely chiral CFTs of central charge 16? Well, if C is bosonic, then it is known that there are exactly two bosonic chiral CFTs. So as we'll review in a moment, this is indeed all of them. But while there are seven known fermionic CFTs, of central charge 16. This is not to our knowledge a rigorous result. So for example, if we fire up Polchinski's volume two and look at how he constructed these seven heterotic, non-supersymmetric heterotic strings, what we would find is that he basically um, uses a construction based on alternative GSO predictions. So he takes basically um, a collection of free fermions on the world sheet and splits them into groups and gives them GSO projections individually. And by taking various combinations of these, you arrive at the seven theories. But of course, this isn't necessarily all you can do, because of course, you could take per two free fermions and you could do lots of other things. You could gauge, you could do any kind of generalized gauging you can imagine, and this could generate some new exotic theory. <clears throat> so it's not obvious that all these theories are indeed all of them. So our goal, is to rigorously classify them, either finding some new ones or proving that there aren't any new ones. And I'm sorry, but the conclusion is the second one. <clears throat> but at least, at least now we know it. Okay, so I said that we know that there's exactly two chiral bosonic CFTs of central strata 16. And this is proved in mathematicians in 2002 by mathematicians. And since this is going to be important, let's briefly review their proof, as well as the two CFTs. So this was done by Dong and Mason. So the argument goes like this. A bosonic chiral CFT must have central charge a multiple of eight. And I haven't said it's unitary, but I should have done. But everything in this talk is going to be unitary. CFTs or SPGs, and if anything is unitary. And if you don't impose unitality, everything I'm going to say is wrong, and we can't do anything. So if it's unitary, bosonic chiral CFT is central charge multiple of eight, which we'll prove in a moment. Now, for such a theory, the partition function, Z of tau, is first of all homomorphic, because it's chiral CFT. But furthermore, um, if we look at the low Q expansion, if we expand it as a power series in Q, where Q is e to the 2 pi i tau, well, it starts off with a singular term, Q to the minus C over 24. That's always there. And then it has a unique vacuum measured by this one. And then the remaining part of the partition function is a power series in Q with integer powers, not half integer, integer because it's bosonic. Okay, so it's holomorphic, it has this expansion, but also it has to have certain modular properties. And these are controlled by the gravitational anomaly. So for example, under an S transformation, Z is invariant, but under a T transformation, it picks per phase proportional to N, where N is related to the central charge. Now, at least when C equals eight or 16, the theory of modular forms uniquely determines what such a function must be. So there's a unique function, and it's given by this. If c equals 8, then z tau is equal to e4 over e to the power of 8. And if c equals 16, then it is the square of that, where e4 is the weight for Eisenstein series. But does z tau uniquely determine the CFT? Well, no, not quite. Let's expand these partition functions to see the low-lying operators. So if you fire up Mathematica or Wikipedia, you can extract the low Q expansion, and it looks like this. So as I said, there's a unique vacuum. And the next term, if we have the E8 case, is 248Q. Now, 
The coefficient of Q counts the number of spin one currents, which must form a Lie algebra G of that dimension of the fusion. So the conditions on the dimension of G, so yeah, what is that Lie algebra? Well, the conditions on the dimension, as well as the fact that the rank must be less than or equal to the central charge, determine after some handle cranking uh, that the Lie algebra must take the form either E8, and whether the current algebra must, must be E8 at level one, if C is eight, and if C is equal to 16, it's either E81 cross E81, so two copies, or SO32 also at level one. So is that it? Are there any more choices, or are these the, the only theories? Well, this time, yeah, they really are the only theories. So how to, yeah, so what's the final step of the classification? So given that we know that the theory has G level one symmetry, we can now go back to the partition function and decompose it into characters, and the result is as follows. So um, I have a question. I can, I can wait or... Okay, well, um, ask... you can probably wait till the two okay. slides when the section ends. That'd be a good point. So we go back to our partition function, and then we expand it into characters for these, for these algebras. So C equals eight, the answer is simple. It's a single character of E8, namely the trivial character, the, the, the character of the identity module. And C equals 16, well, it's just the square of that in the E8 cross E8 case. Or if we're in the SO32 case, it's um, the trivial character plus the spinner character of D16, because SO32. OK. So the final comment is to say that three-point functions are uniquely fixed. You see, the partition function on the torus only measures the conformal dimensions, but there's more to a CFT than conformal dimensions. The other data is the three-point functions. So we have to show that these are uniquely fixed to show that CFT is uniquely fixed. And the argument for this is very simple. If we're in the E8 case, there's only one character. So basically, uh, everything is completely determined by the current algebra symmetry. Likewise, in the E8 cross E8 case, as for the D16 case, well, the fusion of all operators in the identity module are determined fully, but we still have some, potentially some three-point functions to fix, fix involving the spinner. So let's see on symmetry grounds, what three-point functions could there be? Well, you could have two spinners and an identity, but that's just the two-point function of a spinner, which is fixed by normalization. And you can't, so what else could you have? You could have three spinners, or you could have one spinner and two identities, but these are forbidden on rep theory grounds. So we see that there aren't really any three point functions to fix. <clears throat> that is to say, the entire theory is fixed. Hence, at C equals eight, there's a unique bosonic chiral CFT, the E8 theory. And at C equals 16, there's exactly two bosonic chiral CFTs, two copies of the E8 theory and the D16 theory. And note, I'll use this notation throughout. I've put an overline over this theory, but not over these two theories, because I want to indicate that for these two theories, there's only a single character. Whereas for this one, uh, I have to include both the identity character and another character to make it a CFT. Great. So we'll be using these theories a lot. Let's review some important facts about them. So just to recap, here are their partition functions. And this is the notation I'll use. So I suppress the tau dependence because it won't be very important. So they have two important properties. One is that they really have a lot of current algebra symmetry. In particular, they are rational with respect to their current algebra symmetry, which means that the Lie algebra structure really controls the theory. And this, this isn't necessarily true. You know, and it's not true of the monster CFT because the monster CFT has no currents at all. Uh, and that's why it's a, more of a pain to deal with. But that's at C equals 24. We don't need to worry about that because we're only going up to C equals 16. Okay, this will be useful later. And the second property is that these are lattice CFTs. Namely, they are free bosons, modulo and even self dual lattice, which are extremely like simple, nice, explicit class of CFTs. And this didn't need to be the case, but it was. So we could have assumed that all our bosonic CFTs were lattice CFTs, and 
we wouldn't have missed any, but it wouldn't have been a rigorous classification because we would have to prove that they are lattice CFTs, and there's no a priori reason why that should be the case. And indeed, it's not the case at C plus 24, the next little charge. But the fact that they're lattice CFTs will be useful for explicit computations later. Okay. So did you have a question before we want to, before we go on? Or are there any questions now that we've finished the introduction? I think it's good to have some question in between. But in any case, I think uh, I think you mentioned the module invariant fixed partition function at some point, c equal to eight and sixteen. Maybe yeah. two slides back. So just just make sure. So how about c equal to twenty four? Can well, you comment? For c equals twenty four. Well, where this go? Where this diverges at c equals twenty four is that I guess at this step. Uh, in this case, there is not a unique modular form. There's, I don't know, I'm not actually sure, probably two or three possible basis elements that it must be a linear combination of. So in other words, Z tau would be some expression involving Eisenstein series, E4 and E6, but there'd be several terms in here, and each one would come with a constant multiplying it, and then we'd have to worry about the values that these constant takes. So it wouldn't be fixed by wouldn't be fixed uniquely by modular invariance in most cases. Does that answer the question? What's not the question? No, thanks. I don't have other things to say. Okay. But, but so, just make sure your method apply to C equal to 24 or not quite? No, um, these methods do not apply to C equals 24. And nothing we are doing is at C equals 24. I only mentioned it as a digression. Say again? Uh, nothing we do is at C equals 24. We are limited to C less than or equal to 16 throughout. I only mention uh -huh. it for comparison. And you say it does not work. Can you summarize? For both 16, the reason again, sorry, I'm not sure. Uh, I... It's simply that this, where was it gone? Yeah, it's this bullet point here. For C equals 8 and 16, there's a unique modular form of any of these properties. But uh, when I put C equals 24 means N equals 3, when I put N equals 3 in these formulas, this uniqueness, yeah. it doesn't hold. But, but, but there is still some constraint, no? Yeah, it's extremely. So you, can down, you can still write down some some possible forms, is it? Yeah, you can still write down. It's extremely constrained. It's almost unique, but there's some unknown constants in it. It's like there's like one unknown, or maybe two. So I also have a question, please. Um, in the next slide, where you write down the partition function for e. E8 and uh, D here, yeah, in terms of characters, do these, yeah, here. Um, can you, are these characters, can you write down the Q series for these characters as well? Um, I mean, in the yeah. previous case, you gave a very nice answer in terms of uh, E4 and the eta function. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's an expression for these things in, uh, as Q series as well. Yeah, so they can all be expressed in terms of E4 and theta. They can all be expressed in terms of theta functions, actually. I see. So, um, well, D16, for, well, in general, when you have D anything, mm -hmm. all, all the level one characters of that, which are chi1, chi s, chi c, and chi vector, all four of these characters can be written down explicitly in terms of theta functions. And that's basically because theta functions are the partition functions of free fermions. Yeah, and yeah. free fermions are, you know, have Dn symmetry. If you have, if you have, n Majorana fermions, if you have two n Majorana fermions, um, then you have d dn symmetry. So mm -hmm. that means that you have dn level one symmetry. So that means that the dn level one characters are related to partition functions of free fermions, mm -hmm. which are just powers of e theta functions. I see. I see. So and it's a basic, okay. 
it's a so it's a linear combinations of theta functions or it's is the expression easy to write down in terms of theta functions or it's a yeah it's super super easy so it's like um it's a linear combination of powers of theta functions it's like the same power of each theta function i see so, and uh, so in this case um i'm so the the, the modular form is uh for, for sl2z for the full group um so it's a level, uh, what is the weight? Uh, I mean, how do these uh, transform under uh, the s and transformations? Ah, that's given on this slide here. So the so weight- it's the same for the D and E cases as well? Um, the D and the, how do you mean? So- So in the next, so if you go to the next slide, the uh, next more here. On this one? Uh, these, yes. Yeah, they transform, they transform because they are equal to Z in the way that I said Z transformed on this first slide. I did in this, okay. So, but the same thing with the phase factor for uh, tau to tau plus one and this uh, invariant under uh, tau to minus one over tau. It's the same yeah. transformation behavior. Yeah, in fact, since you asked, you asked what's the explicit expression, I, I think chi one of E8, I think it's something like theta two to the eight plus theta three to the eight plus theta four to the eight over eta to the eight. Cool. It's 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 sum of theta to the eight over eta to the eight, summed over theta two, theta three, and theta four. Maybe divided by two as well. I see. Thanks. Any reason? I mean, any, any quick reason to see why it's that or? Yeah, it's because again, um, e eight has a d eight subalgebra. Uh, and. That's basically the reason theta functions appear again. Yes, yes, yes. Theta functions, D8, free fermions, and E8 is just an enhancement of that. So that's why mm -hmm. they, they appear there. Got it. Okay. okay. Thank you. The expressions won't be so nice for the fermionic theories. That's, yeah. So for the E8 level two theory, that's a tricky one. I'm not sure I have explicit expressions for the partition functions of for the characters for that one in terms of anything. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, maybe we'll just confirm again. So I think we are still in the bosonic CFT, right? In one plus one D. Yes. And uh, suppose we know the result that the uh, unimodular lattice with rank 24, they are 24 of them, this uh, Niemeyer lattices. Yeah. And, I wonder, say, whether there are some statement combined with that, and maybe also some constraint for modular invariance, you can still classify C small or equal to 24. Well, only well, certainly, all the Niemeyer lattices, which are the even soft true lattices of Rank 24, um, they yield CFTs, but, you know, that seems to be like, that, that, that only yields the lattice CFTs. Yes. Like, there's no guarantee at all that. Every CFT of C equals 24 is a lattice CFT. And indeed, most of them aren't in that case. There's the Shel Shelkins list. S some of them are lattice CFTs, but there's many more too, which aren't. So, so maybe. So I'm not sure how useful the Nima lattices are for actually rigorously classifying all things. They're just useful for constricting a subset of them. Of course. So since it is a conjecture that all these theories of a given central charge should be related by generalized gauging. So for example, we'll see that this will, we'll see that this is the case for C equals 16. So in theory, you can start off with just a single Niemeyer lattice, take the lattice CFT. And if you're good enough at finding all possible generalized symmetries and you and gauging them, you, you can in theory get everything uh, conjecturally. We have no idea if this condition is true. And also, you know, there's many types of generalized symmetry and they're finding new ones all the time. So you're never quite sure if you found everything. So again, it's questionable how much of a classification you'd have there. So since Gera Horn is also here, I just want to confirm. So what are the, what are, what are the C equal to 24 CFT that will be going beyond this uh, latest CFT? Yeah. Are there, 
on, on, on their many such examples? Mm, you'd have to ask Joe, but but yeah, I think there's many examples. I don't know whether Gerard can comment, just confirm maybe you already mentioned your talk, but I guess it's been some time. The paper you usually point to for this is a paper by Shelkins, where he basically guessed the complete list of sequels twenty four theories, oh. and as a sub, you know, it's later mostly proved. Okay, but but for sequel to A and sixteen, somehow the full class will just be those of the late, latest, right? Unit module latest CFT. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And that makes life easy for us because we will be using both, you know, the fact that they're lattice CFTs and the fact that um, they're rational with respect to their current algebra symmetry will be basically crucial for us. So let's go on. Thanks. So on to the main part of the talk, which is how do we classify the fermionic theories? So we could do the same, we could try to do the same thing that works in the Bosonic case, we could try to look for the, you know, we could try to run the same moderate invariance argument. So we'd start with the fact that the partition functions may be a moderate invariant under a under a, under a different subgroup of a different group of, you know, only for I know only under, you know, moderate transformation that preserve a spin structure, so fermionic ones. That doesn't turn out to be so easy. And the method we do we used to classify them is completely different. So the preview of our strategy is. To find all fermionic chiral CFTs and C less than equal to 16, we will, first of all, use CAC's theorem to find all anomaly-free Z2 or Z2 symmetries of the bosonic ones, and then fermionize them. Now, to understand why this finds all theories, rather than just constructing a subset, first, let's review the basics of fermionization. But I suppose the novelty here is that we'll pay particular attention to some subtleties that are specific to chiral theories, or not necessarily chiral theories, but theories whose central charges differ between the left and the right, which includes, as a special case, purely chiral theories. So this brings us on to our review of bosonization and fermionization, and a strange thing called refermionization. So bosonization takes a theory to another theory. It's an operation that produces a new theory. So in particular, it takes a fermionic theory, which I'll denote in blue, to a bosonic theory, plus a particular choice of anomaly free Z2 symmetry, which I'll always denote in red. And it does so by summing over spin structures. So if we take the input fermionic theory, which is a function of spin structure, then the operation performs a sum over spin structures rho, weighted by some signs, and it's a normalization factor, and this is the resulting bosonic theory. And it's a function of a Z2 background gauge field, because if we're talking about a bosonic theory with a particular choice of anomaly free symmetry, then we'd better specify how it responds to a background gauge field for that symmetry. And so A also appears in this combination of signs. Uh, conversely, fermionization takes a bosonic theory plus a particular choice of anomaly free Z2 symmetry to a fermionic theory by summing over Z2 gauge fields. So here we have basically the same formula, except ZF and ZB swapped around, and the sum, instead of being over the, the accurate of ZF, rho is now over A. And these operations are inverses like you would expect. Wait, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so in this, what is M? M. Oh, M, I forgot to, yeah, M's. I thought I typed that. It's just a manifold. It's the 2D manifold that we're defined on. Uh, on which your 2D CFD lives. Yeah, it should have been point. sigma, really. We usually use sigma for the 2D world sheet. I see. Um, uh, so just, uh, okay, so rho was a uh, spin structure. What is A uh, in the bottom expression? A is always a background Z2 gauge field, which is I the see. same thing as a cohomology class in degree one, coefficient of Z2. Okay, cool. And it will be important that the space of spin structures forms what we call an affine space modeled on the space of Z2 gauge fields. The Z2 gauge fields are H1, Z2. Spin mm -hmm. structures are kind of the same group, but an affine version of that. 
That is to okay. say, spin structures, spin structures, you pick a reference spin structure and all other spin structures differ from it by Z2 gauge fields. So yeah. you might say, oh, just pick the zero spin structure and then we can say, a spin structure is a Z2 gauge field relative to that zero spin structure. But there's no canonical choice of zero spin structure. That's why we say they call an affine space over Z2 gauge fields. Right. Uh, so I mean, a more technical thing is that it's a torsor over the uh, Z motto gauge fields. Yeah, it's so Z motor gauge field backs on that, and uh, that's all. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's, it's a, awesome. yeah. And, uh, I guess it's not relevant, but if maybe we can go over the definition of the ARF invariant as well, but uh, we can we do should. that after the talk, it's I understand. No, it's we should do it now, I think. We should definitely okay. do it now. Okay. <laughs> it should have been at the bottom of the slide. So it was there at one point. So the ARF invariant is a function, a function of spin structure. And what, what function of spin structure is it? It's the mod two index of the chiral Dirac operator with that spin structure. So that is, uh, you take the Dirac operator, which depends on the spin structure, and you count the number of fermionic zero modes, purely chiral, you know, holomorphic. Ones. Okay, and you look at that mod two, and it turns out that although the number of zeros depends on the metric, the number of zeros mod two is independent of the metric, and therefore that's an invariant that depends not on the metric but only on the spin structure. And this is basically the simplest example of an SPT phase in two dimensions. It's an SPT phase for fermion parity. Mm -hmm. And it's, so, it's a, so it's, a, it's a theory, it's a topological theory if you need ground states on any manifolds and, the, and its partition function is always a phase. Well, here it's actually a sine plus minus one depending on whether there's an even or an open but zero modes. Interesting, um, interesting. Cool. So, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, so it's always a, uh, so this power of uh, minus one is always uh, something in Z mod two. Yeah. Or... No, sorry. I mean, I just want to confirm uh, both uh, R of row plus A and uh, R of row could be one, right? Um, yes, if A is zero and row is an odd spin structure, then they would both be equal to one. Right, so then, okay. I mean, I just want, then it's a two, it's not a zero or one. Ah, but that's fine, because it's... Um, and it's okay, as long as it's just even or odd thing that matters here, that's fine. Yeah. It's just a parity. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's... Good. Okay. So here's everyone's favorite example, bosonization. You take the Ising model, which is a C equals one half CFT. If you fermionize that, you get a free may run a fermion. And if you bosonize that, you get the Ising model back. Uh, I should say the Ising model plus its unique Z2 symmetry. Uh, if it's unique, I don't need to specify it. So uh, this is a classic example of bosonization fermionization for a non chiral theory with holomorphic and antihomorphic acceptors. But for chiral theories, however, there may be further subtleties. Uh, for example, bosonization is only possible when the central charge is zero mod eight, or more generally, the difference between C and C bar is multiple of eight. Is it? Actually, it's sort of possible to bosonize when C equals four mod eight too, but in that case, it produces a fermionic theory instead, which we'll discuss in a bit. So here are some subtleties of chiral bosonization. So these issues arise because chiral theories, by definition, have gravitational anomalies and therefore come attached to a gravitational anomaly SPT phase. So if F is the most general possible fermionic theory with a gravitational anomaly, then it necessarily lives on the boundary of SON level one. So this is the anomaly SPT of F. And likewise, if you have the most general bosonic theory, then uh, it lives on the boundary of SO16N level one. Uh, Okay, and we know this from the borders and classification of SPT phases. And again, this is another place where unitality is crucial. Um, okay. Um, so let's review some facts about these, these, these theories. But before we do, let's just make a really obvious observation. So given these two facts here, 
this implies that bosonization of f is only possible if n is a multiple of 16. Uh, and because the central charge is related to the gravitational anomaly by c, c equals n over 2, uh, this means that um, bosonization is only possible when uh, c is a multiple of 8. So the reason for that is very simple. If you took a theory f, where n was not a multiple of 16, and you bosonized it, while bosonization is purely a boundary uh, operation, we will see if it's on the boundary, it cannot change the bulk, which means the anomaly cannot be changed. So if you could do it, you'll get a bosonic theory whose anomaly SPT was not the anomaly SPT of a bosonic theory. And this is a clear contradiction. So if, if, if we're not going to run into problems, S, n must be of this form. Uh, OK, so just, just to review some facts about these two theories, SON level 1 is in general a spin SPT. Its partition function depends on the 3D spin structure. But not always. If n is a multiple of 16, then it doesn't depend upon the spin structure. And so it's a non-spin uh, SPT. Uh, and this is why you have to have uh, this theory is the SPT for the bosonic theory. So only non-spin SPTs can be the normal SPTs for bosonic theories. OK. There is, however, a further subtlety. So recall, as a general and obvious fact, that any fermionic theory f has a z2 symmetry minus onto the f, called fermion parity. It's just defined as the symmetry which acts by shifting the spin structure. So as a general fact, the anomaly of a z2 symmetry of a fermionic theory is a mod 8 valued quantity. We know this from the Borisan classification of anomalies again. So that's interesting. Because that means that fermion parity is gaugeable when n is 0 mod 8. But personalization requires n equals 0 mod 16, which is a stronger condition. So what happens if you try to gauge fermion parity when bosonization is impossible? Well, we certainly can't get a bosonic theory. So the answer must be that we get another fermionic theory. And this is slightly peculiar because we usually say that summing over spin structures is equivalent to gauging fermion parity. And indeed, we have the following fact. If we have any function of a spin structure rho, then the operation of summing it over spin structures is equivalent to picking a reference spin structure rho naught, shifting it by a z2 gauge field, and summing over that instead. This is, again, because spin structures are a torso over z2 gauge fields. So this is a fact. Uh, so if we take zf to be the partition function of this fermionic theory, um, well, something has to go wrong with this statement. So what does go wrong with it? Well, the answer is that the partition function of a fermionic theory with gravitational anomaly n equals 8 mod 16 is not a function of spin structures. Rather, it's a section of a line bundle over spin structures. So this is how mathematicians like to phrase anomalies. But really, the same statement can be cast in a much more physical sense. So if we call that f lives on the boundary of SON level 1, that means that the partition function of f on a given spin structure lives in the Hilbert space of the SPT phase. Zf of rho lives in h of the SPT of rho. And because it's an SPT, this Hilbert space is isomorphic to the complex numbers, but not canonically isomorphic. And this is what mathematicians mean when they say it's a section of a line bundle. Like the fibers of the line bundle are the Hilbert spaces of the SPT and its fiber over spin structures. OK. Now, the crucial point is that not only does the partition function depend upon spin structure, but the space it belongs to also depends upon spin structure. And this is because SON level 1 the SPT is spin, because remember, n is 8 mod 16, we need it to be 0 mod 16 to be non-spin. So because of this, the usual equation obeyed by the partition function, zf rho a, which represents the fermionic theory coupled both to a spin structure and a z2 background of fermion parity. So the usual equation obeyed by this function does not hold. So what is the usual equation? Well, the usual equation says that to couple f to a spin structure and the background for Fermi parity, you simply define the partition function 
speed of partition function with that spin structure shifted by that background gauge field. ZF of row A equals ZF of row plus A. So this defines the left hand side. But uh, in this anomalous case, this cannot hold. It does not hold and it cannot hold because the left hand side, notice, lives in the Hilbert space associated to one spin structure row, but the right hand side, uh, by the above equation, lives in the spin structure, while the Hilbert space of the spin structure associated to row plus A. So this equation is wrong. Thus, summing over the left hand side, if you take that, so summing the left hand side over gauge fields A is allowed, even though summing the right hand side over A is not. And notice summing the right hand side over A is the same thing as summing the right hand side over rho, which is not a function of rho, which would be a bosonic theory. So if this equation held, we would have a problem because it means that gauge and fermion parity would be a bosonic thing. And it's precisely because this does not hold that uh, the left hand side is still allowed to depend upon spin structures, even after summing over A. So this is this is a, a peculiar fact. Now you can explicitly see this um, by working with CFT partition functions. Um, there's, a, there's a nice CFT in, way, way to see this, but it's actually a nicer picture for what's going on. A very simple, nice picture. And this arises from considering symmetry TFT. So what's the idea? What's the idea here? Well, The idea is that you take the anomaly SPT, which is SO1 level one, and you perform a 3D spin structure sum. So the general idea of symmetry TFT is that you have a theory which depends upon a symmetry, is coupled to a symmetry, and maybe it has an anomaly for that symmetry, so it lives on the boundary of an SPT. The key idea is that you make the background gauge field for this symmetry dynamical, you promote it to a dynamical field. So in this case, because we're interested in the spin structure, anomalies in the spin structure, that means promoting the spin structure of this theory to a dynamical variable. And if you do the spin structure sum, it takes you to another theory, another topological theory, which is spin and level one. Now, there's a really annoying fact here. SON level one is a spin theory. Spin and level one is a non-spin theory. The names are opposite to whether they are spin or not spin. Yes, but this is just a fact of life. Uh, there's another difference. We started off with an SPT phase, but the result is a TFT, meaning that we started off with something with a unique, with a one-dimensional Hilbert space, uh, but we finished up with something that has a more than one-dimensional Hilbert space because the states in the Hilbert space of this theory are precisely the spin structures on the boundary. Uh, okay, so maybe just uh, 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 just for clarification, uh, spin structures on uh, uh, manifolds with boundary are uh, defined similar to spin to closed manifolds. So for a closed manifold, it's H two. Uh, sorry, it's a uh, basic H two with the Z mod two coefficients or H one with Z mod two coefficients. But in this case, you might have uh, uh, a relative uh, homology relative to the boundary. Yeah, basically, spin structures on boundaries are incredibly annoying, and there's mm -hmm. some very annoying subtleties with mm -hmm. regard to how you restrict spin structures in the bulk to the boundary. Yeah, and that's what I thought. I mean, it should somehow there should be compatibility with the the bulk and the boundary. The, I mean, it. So the 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 bulk spin structure should uh, restrict to a boundary spin structure, and the boundary should uh, extend to the bulk. So it's uh, there's some compatibility that has to be worked out. It's not a uh, completely canonical, let's say. What do you mean by it's not completely canonical? Is there some choice involved in making a spin structure or uh, is it just some vector space and you choose an element in that, as in the uh, closed manifold case? I guess it's still, it's still a F2 vector space, right? It's and now... And what is the vector space precisely? It's some uh, homology? So you're asking how do I define spin structures when I'm on an open manifold? Well, I, I think you, can't you give an alternative? Can't you define spin structures in an alternative way that 
and doesn't you know you can define them like in an abstract way that doesn't rely on homology at all just involving lifts of frames and things mm. so this thing exists in an abstract way on any kind of manifold open or closed and then yeah I agree. Like, understanding it as a torso over homology or relative homology is then the theorem you prove after having to find it but okay i'm gonna try okay i mean it's I'm like it, it, it's involved let's say that it's uh, but uh we can discuss it later thanks yeah there's a there's a there's a cryptic footnote in one of whitton's papers in 2016 uh, mm. the, the one on um from, you know fermionic spt phases topological phases and anomalies exactly about this issue but it doesn't mm -hmm. go into any detail just mm -hmm. seems to our annoying subtleties and indeed yeah I, I understand <laughs> but yeah so restricting spin structures to boundaries on, on sub manifolds right. is slightly subtle but uh again I, I think we can get away with it here mm -hmm. so we can we can form we can form a 3d spin structure sum uh, and you know that produces a new theory and it's going to be correct to say that um you know the hilbert space of this new theory is spanned by basis states which you can think of as the dirichlet boundary conditions on the spin structure so i can mm -hmm. fix the boundary spin structure to a given row and this will define me an interface from a theory where row is dynamical to the theory where row is fixed Julie, did you have a question there's just to make sure so here n is the multiple of 16. um no in this case i think n can be completely general this this picture is meant to be for general n and this is because i'm allowed to this is a three-dimensional spin structure sum and there's no problem with summing over 3d spin structures it's only two dimensions where spin structures can have anomalies so the gravitational anomalies are 2d but okay we're okay so on the left hand side you have a from in general can be fermionic fermionic spt mm -hmm. yeah some of us been drawn here on the and then on the right hand side of the equation you get some bosonic yeah invertible invertible tft invertible topological field theory why do you say an invertible tft invertible right isn't it non-invertible well in the sense that it is a tft but not an spt it's yeah in, sorry it's been in level one what's the what's the number of uh, ground states or what's, uh, an, what's the partition function on let's say t3 torus well i know the number of ground states on a manifold is the number of spin structures on a manifold precisely for this reason you can you can think of the ground states as being Dirichlet boundary conditions which fix the spin structure in the bulk so you can see from that point of view that it does have multiple ground states and therefore is not an invertible TFT. Um, I suppose, uh, yeah, can I compute the partition function just by computing the partition function of this and just summing that over spin structures? It seems like it should be quite explicit to do and uh, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be one. There's only a way to see it. Yeah, in, in general, the left is invertible, the right hand side is not. Okay. Yeah, I, I think probably, probably you're right. Let, let me also make sure the picture here. So I've not got to that yet, but okay. What, what's the what's the state? What are you trying to imply here? So this F. I haven't I haven't explained the picture yet. So right. what I'm trying to imply is that. Previously, we regarded f as living on the boundary of SON1. But what we can do is um, we can form this new theory by summing over spin structures in the bulk, spin and level one. And so what we have here is we have a region of spin, spin and level one, in which the row is dynamical. But then on the boundary, we fix rho with the Dirichlet boundary condition. And in doing so, it then continues as SON level one. So we're saying that previous you know any fermionic theory can be viewed as living on the boundary of this construction um well okay what what, what it's really saying is that you have a fermionic theory which depends upon a spin structure 
But what you can do instead is you can encode the response vector all possible spin structures um, into another boundary condition f on the TFT. And then to recover the original theory, you sandwich that with the interface from spin and SON, which is the one row. And by fusing these two things together, you recover the original partition function as a function of row. So in a nutshell, it is useful to view f as living on the boundary of this TFT. Uh, instead of viewing f as living on the boundary of the, the SPT, we encode, encode all this information into a single boundary state for the TFT. And this picture is showing how you can use that to recover the original f as a function of row just by fusing these two interfaces or fusing the interface into the boundary. Uh, sorry, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So do you need to specify the boundary on the other side, the SO and level one? I've deliberately not specified it because uh, um, that, that's exactly the point. So it's anomalous. So this thing has to continue or ends on another anomalous theory. So uh, I haven't, I haven't. Uh -huh. But that's okay. So in a way, what can we do with this construction? And what's this got to do with this annoying refermionization subtlety? Well, the answer is as follows. So recall that the interesting subtlety happens when- Actually, let me just make sure one more time. Are, are you trying to refer this as some state in the Hilbert space, like this F and rho? F is a state in the Hilbert space of the TFT, yes. And how about rho? Rho is technically an interface which means it's a state in the tensor product of Hilbert spaces from the things on the two sides of the interface. But I have written it as if it's a state, not as an operator between Hilbert spaces, but a state. And that's because the Hilbert space on the right-hand side is one-dimensional. So there's not really much. It's useful to think of it as a, as a state, even though it's technically an operator to a one-dimensional Hilbert space. So, so are you trying to maybe like uh, write some equation or formula relates the f state to some to the some 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 of the row or something or, or the other way. Yeah. Around. So there's there's no equation here. So the equation should be what well, involves going back to this slide. So, um, this picture, f on the boundary of S O N level one, should have an equal sign saying it's equal to this. Uh, okay. Or in symbols, it should be the equation. Um, it should be the equation that uh, ZF of rho is the inner product of the state F and the state rho. That's the missing equation. Okay. Okay, so um, anyway, the only reason I bring up this picture is because it allows us to understand what's going on very nicely. So remember, n is 8 mod 16. <coughs> so spin n level 1 is the same thing as spin 8 level 1 up to a framing anomaly. OK, now spin 8 level 1 has surface operators of being a group-like fusion, fusing, whose, whose fusion is group-like uh, and governed by the group of outer automorphisms of spin eight, which is isomorphic to S3 triality. So in other words, this TFT has surfaces of being group-like fusion according to the group S3. And these are all surfaces, in fact. Now, operations on F, such as stacking with R and gauging fermion parity, can be interpreted as taking the state F and fusing one of these surfaces into the state f on the boundary. So in particular, there should be a defect in spin and level one, whose fusion with the boundary implements f goes to f times r, and, and likewise the gauging fermion parity. And if, you know, both these operations are of order two. Now, if we look at the group S3, there's exactly two, no, there's exactly three order two elements. Uh, and no matter which ones we pick, if you call them A and B, we find that 
If you do A twice, you get the same thing. If you do B twice, you get the same thing. But if you do A and B, then we get somewhere new. Uh, so we, to make progress towards anything, we have to, to, to do something or something different. And then in this case, if you do the same thing, if you do A, B three times, we close the loop and get back to where we started. So in summary, the symmetry TFT picture shows us that if you take a fermionic theory, then you can do the following. You can stack with R to get a new theory. You can gauge fermion parity to get another fermionic theory. And you can repeat the process. And you generate in total basically six distinct theories or, or three if you don't count this R. So that means that uh, this is basically the universal duality web for doing things with fermion parity when when C is formal date. And this will be useful in the, the last section of the talk when we look at duality webs. But, but as a general rule, this is the structure of stuff you can do with fermion parity. And it also nicely explains why gauging fermion parity keeps the theory, you know, keeps it as a fermionic theory. It's because um, well, from this point of view, it's clear if I, if I have this construction and I fuse something into the boundary, then it's still, it's still staying fermionic. So, so anyway. uh, thanks. That was very interesting. I just uh, I want to understand this better. The second point in particular. Um, so what does it mean that uh, surface operators obey this uh, symmetry of the symmetric group of uh, on three letters? Okay. Yeah. So the S the TFT. Well, mm -hmm. usually when we talk about TFTs, usually we're interested in the enions, and mm -hmm. you know that's a very rich structure. You know, but um given by an, an MTC. But here, we're talking about the topological surface operators instead. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a fact that in, in a TFT, all, all, surface of, all topological surfaces come from condensing, and condensing these enions. But uh, in this case, the surfaces are form a much more simple structure. So the, the topological surfaces form a group, and the group is S3. Uh, we can, we, the reason I mentioned spin A is because the easiest way to understand why it's S3 is that you can think of spin A level one as a Chern-Simons theory, and you can imagine a defect where you implement a discontinuity in the fields, mm -hmm. where across the defect you act with triality on spin, the spin eight, a gauge field. And this makes it clear that for each outer automorphism, you have a topological defect. I see. Um, uh, so this has not, I mean, this is, uh, this has nothing to do with the topology of the bulk in any way. It's just uh, surfaces are not being considered as elements in uh, H2 of the bulk. And you, so, so if you take two surfaces, let's say they're homologous to each other, let's even forget the topology. Let's just take two surfaces uh, in the bulk. Um, then this, I'm just trying to understand this fact. What does it mean that the uh, surface operators obey this um, um, uh, this S3? Uh, um, uh, the, so, so the, I mean, the same manifold. If they're, on, if they're supported on the same homology class, then they obey this law. Uh, that's the, okay. So they have to be in the same homology class and then... The, so if it's, uh, I mean, S3 is a group, so you can take a product of two uh, elements. Uh, on the topology side, what does it mean? So if you, you're you taking some kind of a product of two surfaces or what is... So I'm just having trouble putting the fact that S3 is a group and surfaces uh, are not. So, or surfaces in the bulk are not. So uh, I guess what I need to understand is uh, what is meant by surface operator. So to each two-dimensional surface in the bulk, you introduce an operator, essentially. Um, for each 2D surface and for each element of S3, you define an operator. As I said, you can think of it as a discontinuity in, in the fields across the, across the... Around that surface, I see. I mean, it's just, an, it's just an ordinary symmetry as well. They're zero-form symmetries. They're just zero-form symmetry operators for this group. Uh, it, it does, okay. Uh, it does... Uh... The fact that the surface is a real core dimension one plays an important part here. So if it were uh, a higher dimensional theory, you would be looking at a uh, core dimension one operators or? Well, if it's high dimensional for start, it'd have to be abelian. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's one of the open questions. Um, so, um, okay, spoiler for the open question slide. One of the open questions is, 
The next highest, the next, what happens in the next highest dimension where you can have gravitational anomalies, which mm -hmm. is 660, because you can only have it in two mod four uh, dimensions. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I have no idea, but that's the next dimension where interesting stuff can happen. Nice. Um, I see. It's, it's an interesting question. What's okay, going on? And uh, the last part is just the numeric thing uh, it's uh so the order of s3 is six is that why there are six things in the order? i guess so i guess so yeah <laughs> i guess it's the fact that these two operations as elements of s3 generate, yeah s3, generate s3. S3. exactly exactly okay cool it's like yeah two reflections with this right general cool. rotations as well okay uh, so uh, one sorry sorry okay. I don't want to the, uh, just uh, an organizational question. Last time there was a two-minute uh, break. I'm just wondering if this, if it's planned or not. It's not uh, important. But there could be a spontaneous one. Um, uh, that was because there was a gap in the talks. Um, that's up to Juven. Uh. Well, you can continue, but people are feel free to ask questions. I think during the talk, I, that's that's a principle because. Oh, okay. okay, I just use the mushroom. Okay. okay, thank you. It, you can see, yeah, you can see that there's exactly a halfway through. There is a typo just in that slide. Is that great? Uh, I did run up through a spell checker, but I didn't think it was working because it found no problems. So, uh, spin, M plus two. Hmm? spin M level one is equivalent to spin M plus A level one up to a Fermi anomaly. Is that what you mean? And spin n and spin n plus eight. Yeah, when n is eight mod sixteen. The the first line, is that yeah. N? The the second, the after the is uh, the equivalent relation on the right hand side is spin n plus eight, not a spin. Um, spin are you, are I you think I can get out of this one for free because, um, okay, I don't. I, I actually no, I can't because I never. I never wrote it down, but we're in the case when C is 4 mod 8. So if you combine C is 4 mod 8 with the equation C is n over 2, then we have n is 8 mod 16. So if you then go back to this equation and plug in n is 8 mod 16, well, that means spin 8 plus 16k is spin 8. So it is correct. For any n? No, for n is 8 mod 16 only. I've, I've assumed basically from this point onwards, when I said, what happens if we gauge minus onto the F when bosonization is impossible? From that point onwards, I was assuming N is eight mod 16. Because okay. that's exactly when we're in this situation. And this continues to here. Okay. Well, thanks for pointing that out because it wasn't really stated. So to summarize this section, for a fermionic theory, central charge C, when C is eight, 0 mod 8, we can bosonize. That means we can gauge Fermi parity, and it's equivalent to summing over spin structures, and it produces a bosonic theory. When C is 0 mod 4, instead, we can refermionize, which, again, is, this, is gauging Fermi parity, but this time, it's not equivalent to summing over spin structures, because that's not allowed, and instead, it produces a fermionic theory. OK, so, um, and for all other values of C, we can't do anything with Fermi parity, because it's anomalous. There's, there's nothing we can do. We can probably do other topological operations, but, but not that. With, with other symmetries, but not with Fermi parity. And one more slide before we move on. So the reason I'm going on about bosonization is because it has the following use case for our classification program. So suppose that F is a mystery chiral fermionic CFT or central trial CLS 16. Well, we'd like to bosonize that. So we can say that the bosonization is something we know. But we can't do that because, you know, um, we can only do that on C is multiple of eight. But if it's a mystery CFT, C could be anything. So the solution is stack K, stack F with some number of free Majorana biofermions to raise the central charge to a multiple of eight, which is either eight or 16. So now that means that F stacked with K Majoranas, when bosonized, becomes some bosonic theory, ZB, where ZB is one of the three theories we discussed at the beginning, and A is an anomaly free Z2 symmetry of those three theories. So in order to find this mystery F, it suffices to run this logic backwards. 
start with these three theories, find all Z2 symmetries of them, reverse this arrow by fermionizing, and then remove the free fermions. And this must give us all possible chiral thermonic CFTs n. So that's the strategy in a nutshell and why bosonization is relevant to us. So for that part of the story, only bosonization is relevant. But when we're looking at duality webs, this subtlety will also be, it will also play a role, but it won't play an immediate role. Okay, so that's that section done. And we're basically probably more than halfway through. Um, so if you want to break, now would be a good time before we move on to the rest of the classification and results. We could just, we could just continue. I think we'll, I think we'll continue. Let's try and end a bit quicker. Okay. So we want to find Z2 symmetries. And the, te the technical tool we use for that is Caxton. So by the way, this bosonization thing, the other two groups basically did exactly the same thing. But the next point is where we diverge because um, for them, they, they had to do something more complicated because they were working with more complicated theory that's equal 24. But for us, remember I said that the theories, the bosonic theories have very special properties. They're rational, but they're current order symmetry and their lattice theories. Well, that's going to allow us to use this approach. So, we call the bosonic chiral CFTs have a lot of current algebra symmetry. Here they are, and here's their symmetry. Um, and this symmetry basically controls the theory in the following sense. So, uh, any Z2 symmetry of the theory must induce an order two automorphism of the current algebra. Because a Z2 symmetry must map the spin one currents to the spin one currents, which form a Lie algebra and therefore must induce an order to action on that Lie algebra. So therefore, to classify Z2 symmetries, our first step should be to classify all possible order to automorphisms. And the tool for that is CAX theorem. And it's the following recipe. So to find all order, to find all finite order in an automorphism of simple Lie algebra, so the ingredients are as follows. The ingredients are a simple Lie algebra G and the desired finite order M, which is an integer at least one. And the recipe is as follows. Step one, draw the extended D Dinkin diagram for G, which means you just join an extra node in a certain place. Then you write down the co-marks for each of the nodes, which are just some integers you can look up. And step three, solve the following equation. AI, which are the co-marks, times SI, so you have an unknown SI for each node, and you solve this equation uh, equal to the order you want. So these unknowns are integers at least zero, and they must be overall co-prime. Okay, and for each solution, you get the following result. You get an order M in an automorphism. Specifically, it acts on the Lie algebra in this way, where the vector X is given as an explicit thing where omega i are fundamental weights. So basically, you solve a simple equation and get some very explicit automorphisms out. The easiest way to explain it is to look at an example. And the simplest example is E8. Actually, probably not actually, but the nicest simple example is E8. So this computation is done uh, in a paper by Kulp and friends called duality defects in E8. I should mention the reason they were doing this is because they wanted to classify Tambari Yamagami actions on E8. Well, in general on chiral CFTs, but E8 is the simplest bosonic one, so they did that. And Tambari Yamagami includes Zn as a sub subgroup. So as a first step to classifying Tambari Yamagami actions, you can classify Zn actions and try to extend them to Tambari Yamagamis. And that's why they were interested in doing this. Uh, but as a special case, they do this computation, which is to find all Z2 symmetries of EH, which is what we want. So while we view this computation, so step one is write down the affine Dinkin diagram for E8. Here it is. Step two is write down the comarks, and I've written these down as the numbers outside the nodes. Good. And then the most important step is step three, solve the following equation for the SI. 
Okay, so the SI are integers, and at least zero. So the most obvious solution is take S naught equals two and all the other S to be zero. But that's not allowed because the solution has to be co prime. And two is not, no, two and a load of zeros is, is not co prime. It's going back to two. So the next solution is where you set S one to one and set all the other ones to zero. So this is another solution. And we can see that all the other coefficients are too big until we get to S7. So the only other thing we can do is take S7 to be one and the rest to be zero. So in summary, there's two solutions and I'm gonna call them A and B like in this paper. So the A is the solution where we just take S7 to be one and I'll color this in black. And B is the one where we take S1 to be one which I'll color in black. So black represents a node with S1 equals SI equals one. So there's more to Caxton than that. So not only does this give you automorphisms, it gives you all of them, at least up to conjugacy by other automorphisms. So it doesn't just give you things, it gives you all of them. And secondly, um, are they independent? Well, yes, these automorphisms are all independent unless they're related by a diagram automorphism. But for E8, there are no diagram automorphisms, so they're different. And then thirdly, most importantly, the unbroken symmetry is easy to read off. So the unbroken symmetry is given by the Dinkin diagram formed by the white nodes times u1 to the number of black nodes minus one. So let's go back to our example. So first of all, we know A and B are definitely independent because they're not related by a diagram automorphism. Uh, okay. Oh, God, look at the time. Um, so let's read off the unbroken subalgebras. So for A, we see there's only one black node, and therefore there's no U1 factor. So we just look at the white nodes. And um, these, form a, uh, these form the Dinkin diagram for D8 which means that the unbroken symmetry is D8. Similarly, for B, there's no U1 factor, but now the unbroken symmetry splits in two. So there's a single node, which is SU2, and a diagram of seven nodes, which looks like E7. So the unbroken symmetry after the automorphism is SU2 cos E7, which will be useful in a moment. So we can now get to the actual main thing we want to do. So our strategy is very simple. We just want to formalize all these two symmetries, those two symmetries you've found. But is that it? Well, not quite, because um, remember, we found Z2 automorphisms, but we want to find Z2 symmetries of CFT. So we have to lift these automorphisms of the algebra back to symmetries of the CFT. And this might not be possible. And it might be possible, but there might be multiple such symmetries. So uh, there's that. And there's also the problem that they might lift to C2 symmetries for CFT, but those symmetries might have an anomaly, and we can't formalize an anomalous symmetry. So we have to bear that in mind. So let's continue with our E8 example. So, okay, E8 is nice because for this theory, automorphisms are the same thing as symmetries. Every automorphism for the algebra lifts to a unique symmetry. So we can ignore the second point here. So recall, there's A and there's B. So the only, only the first thing is an issue. So we need to check whether A and B are anomalous or not. Now remember, I said that it was important that our theories, our bosonic theories were simple, but in particular they were lattice CFTs, because that makes it really easy to compute whether A and B are anomalous. So in a lattice CFT, all you have to do is compute the dimension of the symmetry line through the formula H equals half X squared, where X was remember, this explicit thing in terms of fundamental weights given by Kex there. Now, as a general fact, if you have a ZN symmetry and you compute the dimension H of the symmetry line, that's always a multiple of one over N squared. Um, and if you look at the value of that mod one over n, then there's n possibilities. And that's exactly the anomaly for the Zn symmetry, which is also classified by Zn. And 
this is in bosonic theory, so just where we are. So here n is two, so that means that the dimension is a multiple of a quarter, and we're interested in, in, in it mod a half. So it can be either zero or a quarter. So we compute and we find that a has dimension zero mod half, which means it's anomaly three, but b has dimension a quarter mod half, which means it's anomalous. Hence only a can be fermionized. But we should not forget about b completely because it will be useful later. Okay. So what we're doing here is we're classifying fermionic CFTs, C less than or equal to eight as a warm-up. And we have boiled this down to fermionizing the Z2A symmetry of E at level one. Okay, so what, how, do you, how do you finish it off? Well, remember that E8 for level one has partition function given by single character V8. So the first thing you do is you decompose this in terms of the unbroken symmetry. So remember, A broke it to D8. So we can decompose this into, into D8 characters as follows. Now, furthermore, the first one must be even because it contains the vacuum, which means the second one must be odd because it can't be even because if it, if it if they can't both be even because it wouldn't be a non trivial symmetry otherwise. So A must be odd. And this is again where the practice of lattice theory comes in useful because basically, um, the decomposition of the characters just boils down to decomposing the lattices. And this can all be done very explicitly using the vector x given to you from Cax theorem. So the lattice structure really helps here. OK, so that means that we know the partition function of E8 level 1 when we twist by the A, the Z2A symmetry, because this expression tells me how to insert a horizontal twist. And then I can recover a vertical twist by an S transformation, and I can then recover a combination of both twists by an S and a T transformation. So that means I know all partition functions as a function of A, the back and gauge fields, and then it just remains to fermionize them. So we do that using the explicit formula for fermionization, and we compute the partition functions, which depend upon the spin structure, and they emerge as follows. And then we recognize this as being 16 free Mayron of our fermions. Because Well, okay, you just have to recognize it. But remember, as I said in the beginning, uh, level one characters of D8, well, uh, when you, yeah, 16 free Mayron, Mayron of vials has SO16 symmetry. So it should be no surprise that these characters combine to give you partition function for free Mayron of our formulas. And indeed, you can write this explicitly in terms of theta functions too. So uh, this one is like, this one is theta three to the uh, eight over eta to the eight. And it was the same. Hang on, I see a typo. That should be a minus. Yeah, 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 okay. That's a minus. Anyway, in the conclusion, we have shown that the only chiral fermionic CFT is C less than equal to eight are free fermions, which is a pretty boring result. So how we find something more interesting at C equals 16? Wait, sorry, sorry. In the last expression, everything depends on this uh, A. Uh, the right hand, so in the left hand side, there is a Z mod two to the A that uh, goes in the definition. Um, yeah, yeah. So the right hand side depends on this choice of A. Ah, so let me explain my notation. So we start with E8 level one, that's a bosonic mm -hmm. theory. Mm -hmm. Then we have this F of E8 level one, semicolon Z2A. This notation means take that bosonic theory and fermionize it with respect to that symmetry. Uh -huh. so, that so it's... The, yeah, the whole expression is a theory. And then my notation says Z of a theory with a given spin is a, as a, in a given spin structure mm -hmm. is then a function of tau, mm -hmm. tau is suppressed. So okay. Z, Z is a function of rho and tau. And this sub, these subscripts here are the rho dependence and the tau dependence is buried in here. Wait, sorry, what was rho? Spin structure. So these labels, oh, yes. NSR. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. yes. This on the it, yes. So that's the, the easiest example, which is E at level one. And following this program just gives you 16 free out of vials. And so we learn that of the C less equal to eight, 
all you can get is female antibiotics. So what we now want to do is you want to run the same program for the two sequel 16 theories. So let's start with E8 cross E8. So now I ask you, what are the non-anomalous Z2 symmetries of E81 cross E81? Now, again, remind you that a single copy of E8 has two symmetries, A and B. So we can basically get by just by reusing what we know about E8 with one copy. So let's go back to our like, key input. Is that a symmetry induces an automorphism of the Lie algebra. And in this case, the Lie algebra is E8 cross E8. So, what automorphisms are those? Well, either it exchanges the two factors or it doesn't. So, let's look at ones where it doesn't exchange them first. So, if the automorphism doesn't exchange the factors, it must be a simple product of a symmetry acting on one and a symmetry acting on the other. So, the simplest such example is just take A for acting on the second E8 and do nothing to the first. I mean, we, we, could do, we, could, we could do A1 instead, but that would be equivalent. And we can't do B, B1 or B2, because that would be anomalous. So the simplest possible one is A, single A, acting on the second E8. OK, we could alt. So that's the ones with the single. What about with two symmetries? Well, we can do A on both. We cannot now. The thing is, B is anomalous. So we, but the anomaly is Z two valued. So two copies of B is not anomalous. So we either have to have zero Bs or two Bs. So we've done both possibilities with zero Bs. Well, here's the possibility of two Bs. So you add on both B eights with B. So this is why I said the anomalous symmetry would actually be important later. Uh, okay. So remember, I said there's two. Types of symmetry. There's the ones that it's more the ones that don't exchange and the ones which do exchange. Now it turns out that the only automorphism which exchanges the two factors and has order two is the exchange symmetry. Everything else is equivalent to that. There's, there's only one. Um, okay. And the exchange symmetry is a bit special because notice that the first three came from Kac's theorem, but the sigma is external to that. And that's why it's a bit more annoying. But here are the symmetries. Let's try and formalize them. Now, A2 is an easy one to deal with because it only acts on the second E8, which means the person is left alone and acting on the second. We already know what it does from the previous case. So that gives you E8 cross 16 psi. Good. Um, OK. Now, what if you formalize that to E1, A2? Well, in this case, we get a new theory called D8 1 level 1 squared. Uh, I won't, what, what, what this means is it, it is some theory with D8, square, D8 level 1 squared symmetry, but the overline indicates that it's not just some simple character, it's, it's some combination of characters. I'll spare the details. I'm just giving an overview of the results here. I'll run through some details and some examples. Uh, OK, what if you find B1, B2? Well, in this case, remember, B1 preserved E7 cross SU2. And therefore, it should be no surprise to see that the result is e a theory with E7 1 squared symmetry. And as for the SU2, well, SU2 is a symmetry of two complex fermions, which you have here. And uh, the last case, when you find by the exchange symmetry, you get E8 level 2 times a free mayor of Balfermin. And this is interesting because it's the first case we've seen where the level is two. Now, a level two theory cannot come from a lattice. And also this theory has central charge 15.5, which is not an integer. Uh, so it's the first theory that we've seen that is not a lattice CFT. And in fact, this last case, let's, let's, let's look at this last case in a bit more detail. So there's a very slick argument for why formulizing the exchange symmetry must give you this. It goes as follows. So first of all, the exchange symmetry is anomaly free because we can compute the partition function with a vertical insertion of the symmetry line. We explicitly compute it. And the important thing 
is this power here is a half. That's the dimension of the symmetry line. If it had been a quarter, it would have been anomalous, but this is a half, which indicates there's no anomaly. So we can fermionize it. Now, the next step is to note that the fermionization must be something times a free fermion. And this is because when you compute the Fermi's partition function and you expand it, the important thing is that there is a one in front of q to the half. This means that there is a single free mode of our fermion, which must be decoupled, and therefore the fermionization must be something times that free fermion. So what is this something? Well, the central charge was 16, we split off a half, so this something must have central charge 15 and a half. But what is it? Well, now would be a good time to recall that the exchange symmetry, sigma, breaks E8 cross E8 to its diagonal symmetry. And because each copy had uh, level 1, this means that the diagonal symmetry has level 2. So this unknown has central charge 15 and a half and has E8 level 2 symmetry. But E8 level 2 uh, current algebra fully saturates C equals 15.5. So it accounts for everything in the CFT. And this determines the unknown to be E8 level 2 cross psi. Now, I should mention that the, I've, I've, not, I've not mentioned the details of what the CFT is. I'll do so as follows. So the MTC, so the MTC for E8 level 2 is in some sense the conjugate of the MTC for Ising. So that means if you can combine Ising characters to make a free fermion, then you can combine E8 level 2 characters in an analogous way to make some other theory, which in many respects is like a free fermion. The only difference is that uh, it has central charge 15.5 instead of one half. But because the MTCs of these two slides are actually the same, um, they have a very similar structure. So if you were to write down the characters, they'd be just like Ising characters, but with a simple substitution of Ising characters for E8 level 2 characters. So that's a slick argument why this gives you that. Okay, I promise I'm nearly done. Let's just do the remaining theory. So the other C equals 16 theory is D16 level 1 over bar. So what are the non-anomalous Z2 symmetries of this chiral CFT? So here's the Dinkin diagram, well, the extended Dinkin diagram, zero being the extending mode. Now notice that Comax of the sticky out bits are one, but the comax of the middle spine are all two. So we have to solve the following equation equal to two. So it's easy to see that um, there's a load of solutions where you take a single SI equals one from the spine in the middle. I'll indicate these as angular brackets two up to eight. Why did I stop at eight? Because if I had a continued, eight is the middle mode. So if I had a continued, I'd have got stuff that was related by a diagonal automorphism. And remember, symmetries are they're only independent if they're not related by a diagonal automorphism. So that's why I stopped at eight. Um, but there were also the solutions where you set all of these SI to zero. And instead, you take two SI from the corners to be equal to one. So what can we do? Well, we can take zero and one to be the non-zero SI, 0 and 15, or 0 and 16. Now, you might ask, why did I consider both of these last two? Because after all, they are related by a diagonal automorphism. They're related by the automorphism, which flips 15 and 16. Well, recall that the partition function of this theory contains not just the trivial character, but the spinner character. And the spinner character corresponds to uh, the 15 mode. So it's sensitive to flipping 15 and 16. And because of that, although these are equivalent as automorphisms of um, D D16, they're not equivalent by a valid symmetry of the CFT. So these are actually distinct. OK, so now we're going to, so yes, yeah, so what have we done? So these are the automorphisms. What's our next job? Well, we need to lift them to symmetries of the CFT. And that immediately rules out a load of them. Because the point is 
all of these symmetries lift to Z2 symmetries when acting on the trivial character, but not all of them act as Z2 symmetries acting on the spinner character. And some of them act as Z4. And the ones that act as Z4 are all the ones with odd, an odd sum. So we lose half of them, roughly, from requiring it to be to lift to a Z2 action on the CFT. OK, what's next? Well, not only do some things not lift to a symmetry, but among the ones that do lift to a symmetry, there can be a choice, an ambiguity in how you lift it. Specifically, you have the freedom to act on the spinner module as plus or minus one. You can modify the action by a sign. So to indicate this, I'll give each one of these a subscript, saying whether we choose the plus or the minus sign when lifting it to the spinner module. But actually, most of these signs don't matter because they're equivalent. The only places where the sign the plus choice and the minus choice are not equivalent is the 0, 016 case. So I'll delete the subscripts from 2468 and just keep it on the 0, 016. OK. Now, there's one more thing we should do before we go on. And that is to realize that if a Z2 can lift to a Z4, then a Z1 can lift to a Z2. So we should also consider the trivial symmetry, the trivial automorphism, and what it lifts to. So I want to know the trivial automorphism by zero. Now, that can also lift to a Z2 if we choose it to act on the spinner module as minus one. So we should include this one too to find all of them. Right. Then what's the final step? Well, the final step is simply cross out the ones with an anomaly. There you go. This leaves the following four symmetries. Uh, OK, so we have the trivial symmetry, but acting as minus one on the spinner. Then we have four and eight. Uh, roughly, this corresponds to grouping three fermions. And basically, this corresponds exactly to Kolchinsky's alternative GSM projections thing on three fermions. And then this is 0, 16 plus symmetry. So these are the symmetries you want to fermionize them. And here are the results. Uh, if you fermionize 0 minus, you get 32 free fermions. Uh, OK. If you fermionize 4, you get a new theory, D12 but 1 bar, and 4 decoupled fermions. In fact, actually, I've not gone through the analysis for the unbroken symmetries. But it's fairly obvious. So uh, the zero doesn't break anything at all. The four breaks SO32 to uh, SOH cross. Hang on a second. Is that right? Yeah, no. SO8 cross, let's see, SO24. That doesn't look right to me. Uh, I think there's a typo here. I think that four should be a, I think that four should be an eight. Or should it be a four? Oh, never mind. Let me work it out. D12, central charge, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be an eight. OK, anyway, uh, the eight symmetry breaks it to SO16 cross SO16. And this gives us a theory we've already seen when formalizing the other theory. So specifically, we get the D8 1 squared theory again, except this time it emerges coupled to minus under the R topological theory. And finally, feminizing the 16 1 gives you something with SU16 symmetry and a complex decoupled fermion. That's because this 0 16 or let's see, if I go back to here and I uh, Let's see if I delete this node Hang on a second. If I delete zero and I delete 16, it's pretty clear I have uh, SU16 and broken symmetry and a U1. U1 is the another black node minus one, which is U1, which acts on the complex function. Good. So, so okay. just to, okay, never, I mean, in the, the so, I guess it's a question valid over here too, but you haven't. Uh, in the last slide, in the third point, it was minus one raised to power R of what? 
Ah, uh, yeah, suppress the, uh, the next, uh, yeah, this one. Uh, uh, where it goes to. Yeah, so I'm simultaneously using ah to mean a, a function of the spin structure, yeah. b, the, um, the topological field. Yeah, basically, it's a function <laughs> of the spin structure. I've suppressed Got it. it. It's okay. Thanks. I've, it's fine. But I'm, 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 I'm using this minus onto the R to not just mean this function of spin structure, but to mean the corresponding topological field theory. It's right. The DFD, right? It's so like on the left hand side, these are actually the algebra. I found the algebras, but I'm using them to mean the theory instead. Mm -hmm. Got it. So here's the summary. Kind of CFT is a C less than equal 16 are all products of the following building blocks. So remember, bosonic theories are red, fermionic theories are blue, and technically this is fermionic, but it's so degenerate, I'm going to write it in black. So um, what we've learned is the bottom row. You have a free fermion. You have something with SO24, E8, E7 cross E7, SU16, E8 level 2, which is the only non-lattice theory, uh, D8. D8 level one squared. So these three, these four theories, excluding E8 level two, are in correspondence with the odd integral self dual lattices of rank 16, actually well, less than equal to 16. So that is also a non lattice theory. Uh, there's, there's, there's one subtlety uh, in how you put these together, which is that so any theory is a product, any theory less than 16 is a product of these guys, but uh, there's, there's a rule, because two copies of R is just one, so you can only have one copy of R. But there's another rule. So you might think these are like prime numbers, so there's a unique factorization. But apart from this issue, with plus five, and, and you could think of this as being like minus one. But that's not quite true. The analogy isn't perfect, because the thing is that some of these fermionic theories can absorb the R theory. Uh, specifically, when you multiply, you know, this, this is partition function plus minus one, but it can happen that one of these guys is zero when this is minus one. So in, in that situation, multiplying a blue guy by R wouldn't change it because it would multiply zero by minus one. So that's the only subtlety when you're building stuff out of these, the, uh, these R's can disappear. And in fact, most of them do absorb R. I think D8 one squared it's the only theory which does not absorb R. The rest do. Very good. So I'd like to finish off. I thought it'd be cool to finish off by showing the duality webs under the various symmetries for C is a multiple of four. So let's just recall that. The operations of gauging fermion parity and stacking with minus onto the R, the fermionic theories, and correspondingly of gauging and fermionizing Z2 symmetries for bosonic theories, as we've seen, they fit into universal duality webs. So the right one we've already seen. So if C is a multiple of four, C is four mod eight, then stacking with R and gauging fermion parity takes you out these. And it's more well known to see, for example, never mind. Uh, it's more well known that when C is 0 mod 8, you have the following structure. You can stack your fermionic theory with R, and you can stack and you can take its bosonization and gauge C2, and doing so is related to the first thing by bosonization slash fermionization. So this so in summary, these are the universal things that we expect to see whenever you uh, you do stuff involving fermion parity. Gauging, stacking, or, or other Z2 symmetries. But bear in mind that on any specific theory, these webs may be partially or completely collapsed, by which I mean not all the theories need to be distinct. For example, it's possible that going three around this diagram takes you back to the start, in which case the diagram would collapse down by half, or which could, could collapse to a single node. Although this diagram can never collapse to a single node because on the top we have fermionic theories and on the bottom we have bosonic theories. So this always is like these two nodes 
but this one can collapse down to one node because everything's filling it. So here's the result. I said we'd see the slide again, but now we can understand it a bit better. So uh, I'm only going to consider the situations where C is zero or four mod eight, because all the other cases, Fermi power G has an anomaly, which means that you wouldn't be able to do anything interesting with the Fermi net theory apart from stack with R. So all the so just to, to clarify my notation, the red arrows indicate stacking with R, and the blue arrows indicate um, well, it depends. If you have a blue arrow on a fermionic theory, this means gauging fermion parity. And if you have a blue arrow on a bosonic theory, it means fermionized with respect to that Z2 symmetry. And in those cases, there will be a, uh, a label on the arrow saying which symmetry we're fermionizing. But when you have a fermionic theory, we don't need to specify it because the only thing we'll be uh, gauging is fermion parity. So let's start with C equals four. Well, C equals four, as we've seen, the only thing you can have is three fermions. So that's eight main line of fermions, which is a nice theory because it exhibits triality. And indeed, we see that here because eight main line of fermions, our classification shows it's the unique CFT with C equals four. So that means that it must be acted on by the duality web. But because there's only one possible node, all the nodes must be the same, which means that it must be invariant under stacking with R and gauging Fermi parity. And in fact, this is why it's invariant under triality. Well, at least it's a roundabout way of seeing that. So next we have C equals eight. So remember, there's one bosonic theory, the E8 level one theory. And all we could do there was we could fermionize its own asymmetry, which gave us 16 free fermions. 16 free fermions is invariant in a stacking with R, and then we can uh, bosonize it back to get the A level one. So at C equals 12, we get some more interesting stuff. So uh, what we have here is E8 level one cross eight may run of fermions, aka the super E8 theory. And much like eight may runners, it's self trial. But there's three other theories there's 24 free fermions. Now, if you Gauge fermion parity. Remember, we're in the case C equals 4 mod 8. So this gives me another fermionic theory. And this is the D12 theory. And then stack you at R, just stacks it with R. This is then very under gauging fermion parity. So this shows how the six node web can collapse to a three node web. I've not actually seen any example where the six node web stays as a six node web. In all the examples we consider, it collapses to three. So I wonder if there's a C equals 24 example where it doesn't collapse. Uh, in a way, there's a little subtlety here, which is you could ask, why are these two theories this way around? Why isn't the R on the other theory? It, it's weird, right? Because um, why do they behave so differently? And the answer is there's a certain non-canonical choice in how you gauge Fermi and parity. And if you make the other choice, it swaps these two theories around. It's it's an annoying fact about gate and fermion parity in this anomalous case, that there's this non-canonicalness to make a choice. And it singles out this one as the and that's invariant under gate and fermion parity. Okay, and now we get on to the, the main result, which is this figure. So this is the duality web at C equals 16. Here are our two bosonic theories. Uh, and dotted around them are all the things you can get by fermionizing. And notice that there's only one case where they basically overlap up to stacking with R, and that's this D81, the D81 squared over bar case. Now, this picture was basically known a long time ago. This is, this is you know, this is basically the picture of heterotic string theories. For example, recall that the, the shaded ones, which are bosonic, Correspond to the supersymmetric heterotic strings, and the other ones are the non supersymmetric heterotic strings, or seven of them, because although there's actually eight, the two in the middle are basically the same. Okay. So, what have we learned? Well, although this picture is old, at least we know there's nothing hiding, there's no extra stuff we missed. Uh, okay. So, let's wrap up. 
So we classified all chiral fermion XFTs with C less than equal to 16, which, as far as we know, hadn't actually been done before, although we really thought it should have been done before, which is why we wrote this paper. And the way we did it is that we used Caxium to find Z2 symmetries of the bosonic ones, and then we fermionized them. And so now we can be sure that our old list of heterotic string theories was indeed complete. So here are some open questions that I'll finish with. So I've already spoiled the first one, which is gravitational anomalies exist in two, six, ten, etc. dimensions, two or four. So the next dimension with gravitational anomalies is 60. Now, you can therefore ask, is there an analogous story for the spin structure summation versus gauging fermion parity in 60. What's the, what's the analogous story there? Uh, it, yeah, I don't have much to say about it. It's a, it's a tricky question. I know nothing there. But it's the next logical thing to consider. Okay, another question is, do any of these chiral CFTs have any causal supersymmetry? This question is actually completely ripped off from something somebody asked in the second talk ago, Gerald's talk. We'll see the next slide with some more on that. Okay, so here's some more. Um, so as a general fact, when you have a theory with some symmetry and you do something to it, like a discrete gauging, usually we think of that symmetry as being lost. But a more recent point of view would be to say that the symmetry is never lost. It simply becomes a more complicated type of symmetry. Um, you know, for, for example, an invertible symmetry can become non-invertible upon gauging something else. But that's how a lot of the non-invertible ones were constructed. So we can ask the same thing for supersymmetry. We took a fermion theory. It might have had supersymmetry. Well, where did it go after bosonizer? Well, it clearly can't exist as supersymmetry anymore. But maybe there's some remnants of it which when fermionizing back, resurrects a supersymmetry. There should be some remnants of it. So what sort of generalized symmetry is that? Some kind of double algebra symmetry? I don't know the answer. Uh, here's a simple question. Why is it that the number of free fermions that we had to split off from our fermionizations were 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16? So apart from 0, powers of 2. So in other words, why is the number of tachyons in the non-supersymmetric string theories always a power of two? Apparently numerological. Um, I think I've already mentioned this question. So if you look at C equals 24, which is beyond what we did, uh, now look at all this picture here. Notice that it's connected. So for this picture, we could start, say, with 32 free fermions and get everywhere just by uh, gauging Z2 stuff, fermionizing, gauging, whatever, all, all Z2s. We know that that's not the case for C equals 24, that the thing splits up into components. But our physics intuition basically says that if you widen the box a little bit from Z2 symmetries to maybe Zn symmetries or possibly generalized symmetries, it should be connected. <laughs> so this is a pretty awful question. Uh, can we can we realize this? Would be a lot of work because there's hundreds of them. And finally, do these theories have any surprising fusion category symmetries? Because of course these symmetries have lots of fusion category symmetry coming from their affine symmetry. But do they have any surprising extra fusion category symmetry? Um, wait a second. Yeah, like for example, the call that Justin's Justin Culp's E8 duality defects in E8 level one paper was basically asking this question, a special case of this question, you know, what are the Tambari Yamagami actions on E81? Well, you can generalize Tambari Yamagami to any fusion category symmetry, you can generalize E8 level one to any power CFT, thermonicolobosonic. So that's an interesting question. We do like finding, I mean, there are tons of exotic fusion category symmetries 
that's we don't have a we don't know if they can act on CFT, so we don't know an explicit CFT they act on. So I said that the second question we have something to say about. So let's let's say a little bit more about different question number two. So the D12 theory is known as super moonshine, and its n equals one super uh, structure was constituted by Duncan, a mathematician, in this paper, 2000 something four. Uh, using the Golay code by a very nice construction. So what about the other ones? What about the other chiral thermic CFTs, which I've labeled here? Well, actually I missed off three fermions, but that's easy. So the answer to that question was answered in four by Theo, which is particularly awful because he actually asked this question in a previous talk, despite knowing the answer. <laughs> so the answer is as follows. Um, e seven squared does have does have supersymmetry. According to the paper, the, these two don't. But interestingly, there's a question mark for e eight level two. Uh, so the answer is that e eight level two, as as worked out in four, and as embarrassingly reworked out by us, has supersymmetry if and only if there is a real element of the three eight seven five representation, which, when squared, has a zero projection onto the underlined irreps here when you decompose the symmetric square into irreps. So there must be an element of this, which when you take its tensor product with itself, projects onto these as zero. And whether or not such an element exists is an open question, but the answer is probably no. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, for a very interesting, nice, very nice talk. Question comments from the audience. Yeah, so if, if you can please go ahead. Uh, and also thank thank Philly again for staying up late. Thank you very much. Oh yes, thank you, thank you. Well, I didn't realize you were in the well, seminar earlier, but I, you 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 are fine with that. Thanks very much. Oh, okay. So I like staying up late. Huh? No, it's, it's my natural. Oh, you said you need to stay up late. I see. <laughs> Shaya, Shaya, you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, it is a, a more. I just wanted to understand that picture better. Uh, the one with the the earlier uh, Dinkin diagrams. So the easier one, basically, uh, uh, for um, uh, Catch's theorem. I think it was uh, E series. I think E eight or E seven. Yeah, yes, 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 back, back, back. This one, this one. Yeah, okay. I know the the previous one where you labeled the nodes. I just wanted to understand the labeling and uh, what is going on. So um, so this choice of, I mean, the uh, labeling the yellow nodes is an arbitrary choice. You could have labeled anything. I mean, you could have labeled any node from one to eight or... The, the numbers inside are completely arbitrary. They're okay. It's just conventional to label them in this order. Okay, and that's fine. Well, it's not conventional because there are different conventions. And one convention is this convention. Mm -hmm. Although it's definitely natural to always label the zero node by zero because that's the special node. It's an affine Dinkin diagram. Yeah. Yeah, now, yes. Uh, the, I mean, I just wanted to confirm uh, that. Uh, okay, and then, um, so these are really, but I just want to understand them. So so this equation, uh, all the values of uh, SI are, uh, I mean, they're obviously not uh, positive numbers, right? Because then the right-hand side cannot be two. Yeah, so if the SI are numbers. integers that are allowed to be zero, they're non-negative. Okay, they're non-negative, but they're allowed to be zero, I see. And a lot of them are zero. Yeah, they might. They have to be, otherwise you wouldn't get a two on the right hand side. Yeah, so at most one can be non-zero, and that one must be one. Yes, and that is one. So okay, okay. So um, now, how is this choice? So how did you get the coefficients here? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, yeah. So how did? Uh, 
where do the coefficients of these uh, SIs come from? So these are the Comarks AI. Now, what's the definition of a Comarx? I think are the, they the eigenvalues of the Carton matrix or something. Which values of Carton matrix? I think they're the, oh no, they're the, or they're the coefficients of the unique positive eigenvector of the Carton matrix. It's just, okay. a, it's just a leap. There's some, there's, okay, there's some leap theoretic definition of the AI. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it's determined by the Cartan matrix of the D algebra. Basically. It's literally out of the data. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. the easiest, way, easiest way to get them is to open the yellow book in the D algebra's appendix. Um, I see. It's, Thank uh, you. It's in that works. Okay. Um, so, and then uh, in the next uh, case where you make a uh, so this choice of uh, A and B, where um, so why is S one one and S seven one? This is again, uh, or this is again the Lie theoretic thing, or because these are the coefficients. No, SIs are not the coefficients, right? Uh, the SI are the unknowns, right? So my notation is probably unclear here, but each of these three equations is meant to be a separate solution which says that this is the only SI that's not zero. Mm, 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 in that solution, right. And so the first one is B, the second yeah. one is A. That's well, okay, so thanks. That actually clarifies. So, okay. So you'd have as many solutions as uh, twos in... Uh, in this case, yeah. They're okay, exactly the twos. Right. Yeah. Which so works, actually, so. why is the right-hand side two in this case? Because we're looking for order two symmetries. It would be more two. Got it. It's okay. the order we're looking for. In fact, for E8, this is done for lots of like lots of different symmetries. Uh, they're completely classified in the paper that I've linked here. Mm -hmm. you know, look it's at done that. quite methodically and tabulated. Did you need... Okay, thank you. Although they go further and construct the extra Tambarium gummy element that extends these ZMs to ZM Tambarium gummy. Excuse me, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear some yeah. Yes, uh, well, con continue with the same diagram. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, why you just chose uh, S1 and S7 as like the unique uh, reference elements? What's your, why, why I chose those as the reference elements? But why not, you, why didn't choose uh, S2 or S3 or S4 or the rest of them? Uh, because there's no solutions. There's no solutions to this equation. Why those are non-zero? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, but um, okay. No, no. Thank you. Maybe I can ask a question just about the open questions thing. Uh, it, Hi, Justin. Hello. Nice. Thanks for the talk. And there was a very nice paper to read as well. Um, yeah. Uh, on one of the open questions, I think it was the previous slide. It, it's just, are all the C equals 24 ones related by generalized gauging? Now, I thought all the bosonic holomorphic VOAs at central charge 24 were related by a gauging by the construction of uh, Hohn and Muller, but um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm misunderstanding what's meant. Um, probably, probably not. Probably I'm just forgetting what Hohn and Moller actually did. So, okay, so they construct, so certainly all the fermionic ones they construct, well, as a general rule, the fermionic ones must all be reachable from the bosonic ones by fermionization bosonization. Mm -hmm. But is it still known whether the, the bosonic ones, you know, so if you consider the graph, they call it the neighborhood graph, mm -hmm. is it true that this is connected? Uh. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I I honestly was just looking into this the other day. So my impression was that uh, there's basically 71 minus the possibility, uh, just for bosonic theories, there's 71, uh, 71 such theories, except for possibly, you know, ignoring the possible existence of fake monsters. Uh, the, yeah, so, okay, so then, and then basically all of the 70 non-monster CFTs were all related to the leech lattice via this deep hole construction, this generalized deep hole gauging or something like this. The and then they're generalized there. Yeah, there's some generalized deep hole 
thing. Oh, yeah. I, I, remember, I, I remember now. So they define anything reachable by gauging the monster as a generalized deep hole CFT. So the uh, statement would be that all things on the Shelkins list are generalized deep holes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um... So you're saying the answer to this question is you only need to gauge easy twos and the graph is connected. So they're related. I, to... I don't know if. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. You're saying that they are related by gauging just Z twos. Uh, I, I don't know if it's just said twos, but again, I only know the bosonic case, so I I could be confused. But maybe, yeah, okay, maybe maybe I'll I'll email or something like that, and we'll. But yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Well, I. But I'll, yeah, I'll find the paper and then I'll I'll send you an email. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. Any more question comments? So I can, uh, I mean, maybe on the last slide, I just, uh, I'm sorry if you're tired by the way, but. <laughs> not not at all. <laughs> so in the, on the last slide, there were some numbers flashed. I mean, yeah, what are these? So what is a real element of 3875? What is? Oh, this is what you get when you fire up Mathematica, import Liart and decompose the 3875 times the 3875 into irreps. Wait, what is 3875? Oh, so 3875 is one of the representations of E8. It's the label for the rep, okay. I'm just labeling reps by the dimension. Yes. As usual. The standard way to do it. Yes, 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 absolutely. And if you do the symmetric square 3875, you find it decomposes into irreps in the following way. Mm -hmm. Now, yes. so Mathematica knows all the dimensions of the representations of uh, these things. I yeah. In fact, Liat was recently updated to version two, only a few years ago, like two years ago or something, oh, really? which is good because the old one's broken. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Thanks. I did not know that. But anyway, a bit more on this. So does this element exist? Well, if you relax the constraint of reality, it trivially exists. You can just take a highest weight state. And the highest weight state only projects onto the highest weight representation, which is this one. So. Uh, Reality is really crucial here. That's mm -hmm. obviously tricky. So, um, by the way, the reason that we can talk about reality is because all these representations are real. So, general facts about E8, all reps, all reps are real. Fabinus shows into K12 plus one. So, about this question, whether this thing exists or not, well, you could ask an even simpler question. What about just the projection of the first one, just the projection of 3875? So in other words, is there a real element whose square has zero projection onto 3875? Which would be, well, it looks like it would have something to do with uh, an algebraic structure. Actually, what would this imply? Would this imply that there's an anti-symmetric sort of algebra structure on 3875? And that's what's thought to not exist, but proving it either way, just, just making any progress in the question, it's very tricky. Mm. So what is, uh, okay. There's no conjecture either way if it exists or not. It's just it's just yeah, there open is a, nobody's con, putting money on anything. Conjecture is no. There's money on it. Uh, the is no. Okay. okay. So, it seems tricky to be able to prove that the answer to such a question is indeed no. Mm. Even just numerically exploring it is prohibitive. It's like a high dimensional optimization problem. So uh, that's that's just the three eight seven five. What's the 3875, the simpler version of the problem? Then there's the. Suppose you did find such an element, which is thought to not exist, then you could ask the same question for 2700 as well. And of course, there's an even nastier version of this question, which is what are the n equals on structures on the C equals 24 Fermanic CFTs? But that's just diminishing returns, I think. Thank you. Okay. Any any more questions? Okay, that's cool. I think we should wrap up. And thank you very much, Philip. It's great. It's great to have thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Jim, for organizing.